Each week here at Grace Bible Church, we practice taking the Lord's Supper together. Uh, this is that time in our service where we remember and proclaim the Lord's death uh, together. And so if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to put one in your hand. We're going to be looking at Psalm 22. You can just raise your hand if you need a Bible. And some men in the front will be glad to get one to you. If you don't own one, then feel free to keep this as our gift to you. And we'll be in Psalm 22. Psalm 22. In this psalm, David describes in graphic detail the sufferings that would be endured in the future by Israel's Messiah, Israel's King, the Savior. Here we encounter a prophecy depicting horrific, dreadful imagery of the suffering that was required to secure the eternal praises of God's people. This psalm perfectly portrays Jesus' anguish over 1,000 years before he ever died. Jesus ensured in his death that every word of this psalm was fulfilled. And the portrait painted here is one that includes utter isolation, intense enmity, extreme weakness, heartless torture, and excessive humiliation. All these things Jesus endured to secure the eternal praises of a sinful people. Let's look at a portion of this prayer in Psalm 22, starting at verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. In his suffering, Jesus experienced the utter isolation described for us here. In verse 11, he begs God to be near because no one else is. He says, trouble is near. There is none to help. This just reiterates what was articulated at first in the, verse, in the first verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I have no rest. Jesus was utterly forsaken by God the Father. Any comforting sense of God's presence was removed from Christ in those moments on the cross. And the father is here now just depicted as judge. Jesus also experienced intense enmity. Verse 12 says, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. Verse 16 says, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. When this verse says that many persecutors surrounded him, this is not an exaggeration. The gospel writers in the New Testament record that a large crowd, according to Matthew, came to arrest Jesus. And when that large crowd later then took him before the high priest and the chief priest, the elders and the scribes, probably a total of about 70 people, members of the Jewish leadership, Early the next morning, Matthew also records that they took Jesus before the Roman governor, Pilate, and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him in Matthew 17, 27. A cohort is about 600 soldiers. And even in his dying moments, Jesus is accompanied by a centurion overseeing his crucifixion, who would have been accompanied by at least the 100 soldiers which he commanded. 
And so Jesus is utterly isolated from any help from the time of his arrest until his death, surrounded by possibly as many as 700 people at times. All enemies. And these are almost all enemies who intend his destruction. All this to ensure the eternal praise of a sinful people. Also here is described Christ's extreme weakness in verses 13 to 15. So intense was Christ's suffering that his life was expiring with the swiftness of spilled water leaving an open container. His life was rushing out of him. His heart was melting like wax held over an open flame. And finally, we read in these verses of his heartless torture and excessive humiliation that he experienced. In verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Piercing people's limbs was not a Jewish practice. So here David is writing to Jews about a practice that is distinctly Roman that will come later. Just highlighting that this is a predictive prophecy anticipating the Christ's suffering. And while he endured this brutal torment, he was gawked at and further humiliated by them taking the last of his remaining clothing on his body and gambling for it. At the end of verse 13, and for my clothing they cast lots. As he recalls a Roman method of torture, it includes a distinctly Jewish practice, which is the casting of lots by the Romans, the Roman soldiers taking up this Jewish custom against the dying king of the Jews merely added insult to injury. And one final word on this passage, you'll notice in verse 15, the end of verse 15, and you lay me in the dust. This is in the midst of a prayer, you lay me in the dust. This is God putting his son to grief. Which for pur our purposes this morning, it is important to remember not only the human means that God used to put his son to death, but ultimately this was an act of God. It was God the Father who intended, ensured, and ultimately fulfilled these words. He ensured, he desired, he willed, he brought about ultimately the death of his son. And beyond the physical affliction that Christ experienced, the purpose behind this was that the sin of every single believer, those who trust Christ, who place their faith in him alone for salvation, who recognize the guilt that they have incurred because of their sin, God the Father was taking all of that guilt and charging it to Christ's account so that those of us who believe Christ, who submit to him as Lord and deserve the wrath of God, would not incur that judgment, but instead would only receive the blessings that were earned by Christ himself, that were deserved by Christ himself. And so as we, in a minute, drink a little cup of juice, eat a little cracker, they are merely symbols of what we read here, that what Christ accomplished in the tearing of his body, in the spilling of his blood, the giving up of his life, that this was our purchase price. This is what it required to satisfy the wrath of God against us. This is for those who trust Christ, uh, if you are here and do not profess to be a believer, if you don't submit to Christ as Lord, trust him as Savior and King, then we're glad you're here. So thankful that you get to be with us and hear the gospel. Uh, 
but this time is distinctly for believers. And so we would invite you not to, to partake of communion with us, but rather to reflect on what we've read here, to reflect on Christ's suffering, and where you stand before God. This was done on behalf of those who believe Jesus and who willingly submit themselves to him as Lord. Christian, examine yourself. If there is any sin you're aware of in your life, confess that to the Lord and be thankful that Christ offered up himself in this way on your behalf. And when you're ready, you can feel free to take the bread and the juice on your own. Amen. Come serve us, please.